Welcome to the inaugural Fun Play Summit. I'm Benita Fitzgerald Mosley, our president of Fun Play and head of community and impact here at LEGAX. We couldn't be more excited that you're here to celebrate sports-based youth development, learn together, and connect with others in the sector. At LEGAPS, we're more than just a technology company. While we do provide the operating system with registration and payment collection and communications tools uh, for youth and local sports, we're also building a community of youth sports professionals to network, learn from each other, and from leaders in sport and beyond. Our team and our culture are deeply rooted in our core beliefs, one of which is sports for all. It is our commitment to ensure all kids have access to youth sports and vast opportunities, healthy outcomes, connections, and other benefits that come along with that. We want to ultimately make youth sports better with higher quality experiences for all kids and more accessibility for all communities. To co-host with me today, I'm joined by Jared Cooper, our Fun Play Program Director. So Jared, please join me in welcoming our community here today and join me up here on stage. Thank you, Benita. I'm thrilled to be here today with you to host this event for sports-based youth development organizations around the country. It's been a pleasure getting to know so many of you and learning about the great work you're doing. And I'm looking forward to meeting and speaking with those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. Our Fun Play program provides League App software and capacity building and professional development content for sports-based youth development organizations serving kids from under-resourced areas. You'll have a chance to learn more about what our grant program entails later this afternoon. Throughout the day, you'll have a chance to connect with other leaders from across the SBYD and broader youth sports space, experience impact spotlights to be inspired, and hear from experts on data collection and evaluation, and board management and fundraising. We hope you'll take full advantage of this great event. Absolutely, Jared. And before we get started with our first panel, I wanted to quickly review a few things about today's event platform, Remo. Right now, we are in presentation mode. So as you can see, um, you can see and hear our speakers, but your mic and your camera are automatically turned off. You can use the chat or the Q&A functions to engage with our speakers and your fellow attendees. And once the session is over, we'll return to networking mode. And there you can move between tables to chat with your fellow attendees. So if you need any help, you can DM a staff member, a next up staff member, or you can visit our info booth table. We're here to help you. And with that, let's get started. Uh, kicking us off, we have a conversation I'm personally very excited to listen in on. Uh, you may have heard that earlier this month, New York passed a mobile sports betting bill, and in doing so became the first state to allocate a percentage of tax revenue from mobile sports betting to youth sports nonprofits. This is going to be game changing for SBYDs in New York State, and it wouldn't have been possible without the leadership of Assemblymember Monica Wallace, who was elected in 2016 to represent the 143rd Assembly District in Northwest New York in Erie County. When League Apps caught wind of Monica's proposal, we immediately offered to support her. We hosted her for an event with New York-based SBYDs uh, in New York City and Western New York primarily to make them aware of this proposal, led a sign-on letter that was sent to New York State leadership advocating for this proposal's inclusion in the final bill, and led a grassroots outreach campaign leading up to its eventual passage. Uh, and we're thrilled that we were able to play even a small part in helping Assemblymember Wallace make this a reality. Uh, in conversation with Tom Ferry, the Executive Director of Aspen Institute's Sport and Society Program, uh, Tom is also a tireless advocate for this model of youth sports funding. Monica is going to tell us about her advocacy for the youth sports allocation, what it took to make it happen, and how this could be a model for other states nationwide. Tom, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Jared, and thanks to uh, really the whole team at League Apps, um, and congratulations on the, on the Fun Play Summit. Um, it's an exciting uh, development, a terrific event, and uh, really appreciate you pushing forward some of the big ideas in, uh, in youth sports and how to fill these gaps. So, and uh, Monica, uh, Assemblyman Wallace, great to have you with us. Um, you Thank have you been so much. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be here, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, you've been, you've been the champion of this thing. You, you made it happen. You push through this 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 bill uh, or this this uh, allocation for for youth sports tied to 
sports betting, New York being the first state to, uh, to introduce uh, mobile sports betting with a carve out for, uh, for youth sports. So let's just sort of step back here. Um, what is your connection to the youth sports? Are you a, a former uh, you know, WNBA player, uh, some, 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 some star who absolutely uh, wants to develop elite athletes or how do you <laughs> I, I wish that were the case. Uh, I am cursed with not being particularly coordinated, so uh, no aspirations of any Olympic goals or Olympic medals in my life. But I am somebody who believes very passionately in equity, and uh, I'm somebody who uh, is, if you're a little familiar with my bio, I always say I was raised by a single mom. Um, and I'm I'm that kid who got, you know, free lunch in school. I'm that kid who uh, got TAP and Pell assistance and was able to go to college and graduate and then go to law school and graduate. And so now, you know, now that I'm in the assembly, I take very seriously, I, I say also daycare is a big thing with me. Um, I was that kid who literally had like a key around my neck that I would use to get in after school because there really wasn't after school care, certainly an after school care my mom could afford. So um, I take very seriously, you know, the opportunity to use my experiences to show how I, you know, the opportunities that were created for me, the free lunch program, the access to uh, grants to get through college and law school are vehicles for me to make sure that, that I can help lift up the next generation because I was sort of able to make it into more of the middle class. And I wanna make sure that, that those vehicles are there for other kids. And so when I stumbled upon your research, um, incredibly impressive body of work relating to how we can make sure that we create more equitable communities through sports. And to me, that was sort of right in, in the wheelhouse of things that I care very deeply about. And uh, so that's why I, I picked up on the idea of this and uh, really was incredibly helpful to have the research that you have as a vehicle to sort of have this conversation. Yeah, so I mean, you believe that youth sports is critical in building healthy, vibrant community. So how did, I mean, how originally did you come across this idea? So in connection with what I was saying, my passion to be able to create, um, you know, access to opportunities for kids generally in a community that I represent a very modest, uh, you know, lower income or uh, working class community with similar, you know, struggling families. I've been trying to create a, a boys and girls club in a, in a town that doesn't have one that really needs one. And, and I was talking to sort of a friend in a formal life who works in the same space you do, uh, Bridget Island, who was talking to me about uh, ways that we could, you know, use the vehicle of the Boys and Girls Club to help get kids more active. And in the context of those conversations, she brought up this idea and mentioned that there had been some research done about it, the whole Project Play uh, research that you've been doing. And so I, you know, looked at that and ran with it. And I was really excited. She and I started having conversations about it. Um, I started having conversations with more people about it when I researched when, when I looked at the research and read the research that you had, it really helped lay the foundation for making the case that this is a wonderful opportunity. Not that I love the idea of, of sports betting, you know, I'm sort of more ambivalent about that um, and, and have concerns about expanding access, but at the same time, understanding that if it was going to go forward, this is a great opportunity to take, um, to create a revenue stream where none exists and to really use that uh, ac expanded access to create opportunities for kids, especially, you know, one of the things that I think you and I have talked about in the past is how this pandemic has exposed the inequities in our society on so many different levels. And I think one of the things that we've seen is how lower income communities are getting sicker at higher rates for many reasons. Um, the fact that so many of them are essential workers, lack of access to the same kind of health care, but also just having, you know, more incidences of diabetes and more incidences of, of uh, people being overweight. And so if we can, you know, try to less access to healthy food, things like that, and, and less access to sports and starting those healthy habits when kids are younger. So this is a great way that we can start building healthier communities from the ground up. And so I, I think the pandemic just has really exposed and pulled back the curtain on so many things that we knew were already there and created more of an urgency to get these things moving forward. So, um, you know, I think the data being there, 
the timing of passing this legislation and then the fact that the pandemic kind of all uh, converged and just created the perfect storm of, of being able to create and move this legislation forward. Yeah, you know, the nice thing about this idea is it, it didn't come out of nowhere, right? I mean, it has been introduced, it has been tested. I mean, I originally came across it when I was um, covering the uh, the Olympics in Korea, um, Pyeongchang um, and Norway, you know, won more medals than any country in the history of the Winter, Winter Games a nation of, you know, 5 million people the size of, of Minnesota. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world did they do that? And oh, look, they have 93% of kids playing organized sports in their country. They're one of the healthiest nations of the world, one of the happiest nations of the world, one of those that has, the, you know, the most vibrant democracies out there. I'm like, how do they, how do they do this? And how do they get it funded when they got it funded in part through sports betting? This has been going on for many years. It becomes that, that carrot you know, that, that uh, for matching grants for community. So, it, it, I mean, it was, it was so exciting to me that you came across this idea and said, oh, you know what, maybe we could, maybe we could do this in New York. What's amazing to me is that you were able to actually like sell it and get it through, uh, you know, uh, in relatively short order, just a matter of a few weeks or so. So when you were going in with this, when you were taking this idea and putting it before people, I mean, how likely did you think it would actually happen and how did you, <laughs> how did you build support for it well uh building support conceptually first of all um as you know we work with outside organizations include uh including jared cooper from league apps and others to try to help build that community support which as as i discussed is, is always important to you know sort of create that groundswell of support um on the field or on the you know outside in the community and that on top of you know me directly in from the inside speaking with legislators and when i had these conversations i mean and, and i think as you said in some of your research like there's there's an obvious and logical connection between the idea of using some of this money to build the next generation of healthy active sports fans and sports participants right um, people who understand and respect the game and know the rules and want to aspire to be sort of uh professionals themselves some or just just want to be able to get out there and and play basketball or play hockey with some friends and um and so it, there is a, a logical connection and i think everybody even people who weren't that crazy about the idea of expanding access to online gambling said, you know, well, it does make sense that if we're going to do that, we use some of the money to, so I don't really think that there was, or maybe it was because we, we did it in such short order, there wasn't an opportunity for anybody to organize against us, <laughs> which is always helpful as well. Uh, but I think, you know, just sort of seeing the writing on the wall, working really hard on it for a couple of weeks. And I think I, I texted you or, or Jared uh, pretty close to when I, when I was 99% certain that it was going to be part of the budget, but you never know until that bill hits the floor and we vote on it. So I was like, listen, I think, but don't, you know, keep your fingers crossed, but don't say anything yet because you just never know. And you don't, you don't, you know, you, you hope. And, and so I'm very happy that we were successful and I appreciate everybody's work to make it happen in such short order and and like i cannot say enough about how incredibly helpful the research that you did was to build that support. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, so, so it sounds like it's an idea that resonated with, correct me if I'm wrong, with, but with Democrats, with Republicans, with people who are in favor of sports betting, people who maybe were on the fence or maybe not in favor. It, it, it just seemed to be sort of a, a logical winning argument when you put it before people. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, who doesn't think that kids should have more access to sports and that everybody should have the chance to play, right? And I think we all a lot of us, you know, my kids are uh, just about grown up now, and um, but they played in sports. And I can say as a parent, I understand how it's very different now than it was when I was growing up, even, right? It was much more like at the pickup game on the street, whereas now it's it's much more professionalized. Um, people are doing travel this and travel that, and, and the expense is really considerable. And your research, you know, bears out that, um, you know, for certain communities, it's not an issue, and they're gonna they're gonna sacrifice to make sure that their kids can play in these. But for some communities, it's just not as as hard as they might want. They just don't have that ex excess money, and and everybody should have the chance to sort of develop all the skills. And on top of that, we know it's not just about 
physically healthiness, it, physical health, it's mental health, it's emotional health. It is, um, you know, your ability to excel academically because you've been involved in sports and the soft skills that you get from being uh, part of a team and learning, you know, to work together and to rely on each other and to be a good sport and all of those things that we know help you know, I know I've, not your research so much, but I've seen research about how many CEOs are former athletes. And I think that speaks to all of these ancillary skills that you develop from participating in sports that you're kind of, if, if you have a group of people who are not able to participate, they're missing out on those opportunities. And so, um, and, and another thing, you know, with the pandemic, we saw emotionally how difficult it was with these kids when they were isolated and how that's taken a real toll on them. And I have spoken to um, parent groups throughout this pandemic who are frustrated and wanted the opportunity for their kids to get back into sports. And we talked about how to do that safely. And I've spoken to the governor's office about, you know, what are the criteria that we need to make it happen and how can we test and do all these kinds of things, recognizing how incredibly important it was because kids were really suffering from the absence of sports in their lives. Yeah. So what are the next steps here, Assemblyman Wallace? I mean, in New York State with this fund? So the fund was authorized. And um, and so right now, I think we need to sort of wait until the Office of uh, Child and Family Services, o OCFS is what they call it, um, is the agency that's going to administer the fund. And my understanding is that they're going to create some grant criteria. And I will be in touch with them over the next couple of months, you know, trying to help guide that process and talk about, you know, how it is uh, that what what are the things that we should look for, and create as factors and criteria that make it, you know, there's so many organizations that might qualify, but we really want to make sure that the money goes where the money will do the best uh, work and have the biggest impact. And so, uh, you know, to the extent that we can continue to have these conversations and try to use your research and, and other data out there to try to identify, well, what are the components that will make this money, you know, get your biggest bang for the buck for this money. And, you know, one of the things I think you and I have spoken about is, is the importance of making sure that where this money does go, the individuals who receive the money should definitely be using, documenting how they're using it and what the outcomes are so that we can make the case that it actually has had the impact that it was intending to have and you know keep asking for it to be not only reauthorized but potentially even expanded if it continues to have you know the greater impact that we talked about. Um, one of the things I, I found very compelling in your research was how much money a state can save in healthcare costs if kids are more physically active and health and healthy. And if that seems to be the case, you know, with this money, if we know, for example, we give it to a particular organization and then, you know, they show lower instances of this, this, and this, well, that's proving what you know to be the case very directly. And it will make a more compelling case for let's spend money here because we'll save it on the back end in the future. Yeah. So the importance, uh, the reason you want to show impact is because, and I want to get real clear on what has been committed to, right? So in the first year, it's 1% of proceeds. Oh, no, actually, it's, yeah, 1%. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1% of proceeds from, from sports betting. And every year after that, it's $5 million, uh, you know, that that's in the, the language of the budget. Yeah. And I think that that was, that was because we really just didn't know what 1% would look like, what, what, you know, so we kind of said, okay, well, how about, because I was originally advocating for 5% and that didn't go through, but we really, I mean, 5% could have been $20 million or it could have been $2 million. So we thought it might be better to at least put a dollar figure in there as a cap and, um, and then go from there and, and be able to assess the need. Did, is, is there a need for 10 million or is there only a need for 20, for 2 million the next year? Um, I, I'm going to guess it's going to be a bigger need than 5 million, but you know, let, let's see how that goes. Yeah, so that number, um, I mean, there's the intent $5 million annually going out till whenever, but it could get renegotiated every year, right? I mean, is, is it something you're gonna have to fight for every year and that number could grow or it could shrink in part yes. depending on yes. the impact that, that, that is demonstrated? 
that's the nature of budget negotiations, unfortunately. You never know, you're never, you know, I mean, a lot of what I do as a legislator is meet with groups all throughout budget season, which is basically January through March, where they're just advocating to make sure that the money that they usually get is at least met. And then they always ask for more. Um, so it's always a fight to even keep what, you know, what was already allocated, but it's at least easier um, than creating something from scratch. One of the things that I was very cognizant of is if we had already created this sports betting mechanism and allocated the funding to other entities like education and, and addiction, which it is, and some other things, uh, it would have been hard to pull that back, a percentage of that back. Now we're in, we're one of the things that, we're one of the uh, funding streams from sports revenue. So we're not taking from anyone else mm -hmm. um, if we were to move forward, you know, I guess is the way to look at it. Right, gotcha. So let me ask you this, are there ways to use this money, this $5 million commitment uh, to get the private sector to co-invest invest as well, right? I mean, one of the reasons that, that foundations and corporations don't invest much in youth sports from our research is just the disjointed nature of it, right? 150,000 organizations, uh, you know, how do you get to scale? How do you measure impact? Do these people even have grant writers. And so it's a space that really hasn't been um, organized very well. But what's interesting to me is, I mean, you learned about this opportunity and the needs in your region through the work of Project Play Western New York, which is, you know, this collective impact initiative that, you know, helped and we helped them do it as well, but landscaped the state of play, understood the gaps, cranked the numbers on, you know, how much money would be saved in healthcare or economic productivity, uh, sort of made the case and kind of laid it out. And then they've continued to bring groups together uh, to connect the silos and develop shared agendas and develop shared opportunities. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, I mean, are there ways to, um, you know, use these state funds to fund more collective impact initiatives in other parts of the state, for instance? So they can bring folks together and collaborate and maybe make bundled asks of, of grant makers. Is, is that a possibility? You know, I think that's a really excellent question. And I just don't have an answer for that at this point in terms of how to do that. But I think we need to start asking that question and thinking about different ways to create that opportunity, right? Um, and whether, you know, when we, when we have a better sense of the criteria, uh, maybe we can encourage we can encourage private organizations to do matching grants, right? So if you get, you know, ten thousand dollars for from the state money, we can encourage an organization to do a matching ten thousand dollar grant, so that it sort of doubles the impact of that money. And at least then, I mean, I think you know, a, an outside organization might say, well, if the state thinks that that organization is a worthy investment of taxpayer dollars, then I can feel comfortable because the state does do its homework in terms of making sure that it's an organization that meets certain criteria before they can even get like we just can't give out state money any not for profit in fact a lot of times it's difficult to get money for not for profits um unless for example you know they they might be doing addiction services or they might be doing you know mental health treatment or something there's certain organizations elder abuse issues but but we can't just you know you can't just create a not-for-profit and expect you're going to get state money for it um it has to be vetted i guess is the right word and go through a certain procedures and and have bylaws and all these things be duly organized so um so that kind of creates a comfort level i would imagine that the money is going to go to where the money you know I don't want to see this money go pay for $400 bats for you know a community that can otherwise afford it. Um, this is money that needs to be spent responsibly uh, for or for to, to really help create opportunities for for kids who might not have that or communities that might not have access. Yeah. Um, so, and I think your research creates a lot of that foundational information and we can keep working with all of the organizations to try to identify exactly what the criteria should be moving forward and then creating with the um, uh, with the state the right uh, guidelines. And then, like I said, I think that the private sector can maybe get a comfort level that this is 
an organization worthy of investment. Gotcha. Especially if, as I said, we're trying to then follow the money and make the case that it did what it was supposed to do. So then that creates even more comfort, right? Like it's a layering of, yeah. of you know, sort of here's the idea, try it out. We proved it. Let's do it. Let's expand it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so what's exciting about what you've done is, is New York is the first state to, to, to do this. Did, when you were pushing this idea, did you know that? Did you know that nobody else had done this? I knew other states were considering it, but I guess, you know, it's super exciting that New York was the first one to get it done. And uh, I'm, I'm really, I, this is wonderful. I'm really excited to see where this goes and how hopefully it can inspire other states to think about trying to do something similar. And uh, especially if we start proving sort of the thesis that this is going to have the impact that we think it will, and that will even create more excitement and more um, support for something that is very common sense. Yeah, so I spoke uh, recently to uh, uh, James Kilsby, one of the top analysts in the space who tracks his stuff nationally, what's happening with sports betting legislation. Uh, and, and he was like, look, this idea kind of makes sense. There, there are a lot of things he doesn't like about the New York bill, but he liked this one. And he thought that <laughs> intellectually he could see other states adopting it. The key is to, to find the Monica Wallace in each of those states who's going to be the champion and try to make it happen. So for other organizations that, that like this idea or other states that are thinking about it, how, uh, how to crack this nut, how do you find that, that, that advocate in local and state government to, you know, to make the case? You know, I guess I would say to try to identify somebody that, you know, like me has made it an agenda item to try to create more equitable communities, especially involving kids, like somebody who's very passionate about making sure that um, we give everyone sort of that equal opportunity to excel. And so whether, you know, and, I, and I'm sure that there are lots of, you know, most people go into government because they care very deeply about being able to create positive change in their community, whatever that looks like to them. And so um, whether it's people who care very much about youth sports or about, you know, making sure that there's safe opportunities for kids to engage in, in extracurricular activities, somebody like that, I think would be, but then also, you know, just again, I cannot emphasize how, how important it is to have that research because the research really provides the support for the argument. Um, yeah. I'm just sort of, you know, relaying the information that I found very compelling and the information was all this, the, the support out there that existed. So it really, and, and I think intuitively as a mother, as, you know, somebody who's in the community, you can make that logical connection. Like, yeah, I can see how, you know, making sure that every kid has the opportunity to play. And I know, for example, how sports could have positively impacted my children. And so everyone sort of sees like that makes a lot of sense. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And how important is it to have that grassroots piece? I mean, what was great is League Apps and the Youth Sports Collaborative and a number of organizations came together, created a petition, folks began to sign on. There was a social media uh, push around it. H how important is that piece? Tremendous. Tremendous. And it's always because, you know, representatives always want to be responsive to their community. And when they have that community really pushing for that, then that creates sort of the groundswell of um, support for it, right? So you, I, as I said earlier, you had the outside influence and then you have somebody on the inside and pushing together to make it happen. Um, the one thing I would say is, I think you need to wait until the community is ready for youth sports betting, for mobile sports betting or some you know, expansion of sports uh, betting that was on the table. Our community wasn't ready a couple of years ago. You know, this had come up before and I know there was a lot of concern in the community and in the, in the legislature about, do we really wanna do this? Is this some, but I, like I said, given the pandemic and the, the fiscal realities of where the state was, I, I knew it was likely to happen. So given that, let's jump in there and do it is, is gotcha. the way I felt about it. Right. So, I mean, you're going to get a lot of people who, because once, once there's a revenue stream, everyone's going to have their hand out and want, you know, some people are going to want it to be exclusively for addiction services. Some people are going to want it to be exclusively for, um, 
for education or you know other things so making the case that at least a piece of it should go to this is really not that hard of an argument but it's yeah it's something you got to keep up the work while you're doing it creating the outside uh pressure like you said with the grassroots movement and then also the inside arguments and uh so i think that's the way that's the way it worked you know yeah so it's times like everything comes together and this was one of those times yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's the idea of just like taking from the treetops of sports and giving to the grassroots, just making that 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 argument as uh, as clean and as uh, clear as possible seems to have a lot of value. Now, what about and you referenced this earlier? Look, you know, this betting, gambling has brings addiction, uh, has all sorts of other issues as well. So, you know, how do you reconcile the benefit of the tax revenue? With the potential societal consequences of, uh, of of sports betting. Well, I mean, it's difficult. Uh, I, you know, we also just passed marijuana legislation in New York State, right? And it's the same. It's the same thing. You know, with every vice comes uh, potential. You know, we shouldn't be passing it just to get the money. But, you know, because I do know a lot of people really wanted sports, mobile sports betting. There was a huge movement of people who really felt like they wanted to be able to do this and, and why shouldn't they? And maybe we're doing it illegally already. Um, and so this created a vehicle and now the same arguments related to marijuana as well. You know, people were already doing it. Let's legalize it. Let's regulate it. Um, and so, but there, I do think that there's a recognition that as with marijuana, as with sports betting, um, it is a vice that could create an addiction and therefore we need to invest, use some of that money and invest it in making sure that uh, we treat people who become addicted and, but also we invest in the education piece to make sure that people um, are aware of the dangers and try to uh, recognize it and be more careful. Um, so, you know, I, just like anything, when you have more access to it, the research shows that yep. you might be more likely to develop an addiction. And so that's what we do have to be very careful about in the marijuana sphere and in the in the sports betting sphere. Yeah. So Sally, your perspective is don't legalize sports betting because we want to pay for you sports. It's if you're going to legalize sports betting, then please think about you know, funding community-based play. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So, so you know, if, if other states adopt this model, and look, there are about half the states in the country have not to date, and uh, even more than that have not adopted mobile sports betting, and, and there's going to be a lot of this activity is going to happen over the next two or three years, um, state by state. You know, if more states adopt it, what impact do you think that might have nationally on youth and and youth sports you know more funding due to sports betting revenues I, well i think it could be very compelling but i just want to say as you're speaking i was thinking back to you know when i said new york wasn't quite ready yet i think new jersey uh among other states were in the were one of the first to to do the mobile sports betting and a lot of because it's so close to new york really close in some places um, a lot of people traveled over to New Jersey to, to place their bets and then travel back. And, and so there was a, a significant percentage of revenue that New Jersey was getting from New York betters. And that kind of made New York a little bit more ready, right? So to that point, I think you have to sort of try to read the tea leaves in terms of when the community is ready to adopt this, if they are, and then you know start making that argument about youth sports and how it can have that compelling impact. And I think uh, to your question, you know, I, I think it remains to be seen exactly how impactful I think your research bears out that it could be tremendous, mm -hmm. um, but we need to wait and see and continue to document uh, and, and show that it is exactly what was anticipated. So, um, so I, I think it could be fantastic and really could hopefully get us to be the next Norway. <laughs> Right in the Olympics, <laughs> uh, yeah. but uh, where we have not what was it ninety five percent participation or something you said by by kids in sports or sports in that in that country yeah so I mean, so, I mean it would be great dropping out or they they can't afford a sustained experience 
So uh, this is really important. I mean, because one of the big challenges that we've discovered since we started Project Play is there's this great need at the base and that need is tied to funding. Um, but if you have the funding in place, then you can begin to put the quality criteria in place. So you can, you can, you can both grow access and grow, grow the quality that's going to create more of a, you know, a sustained experience because kids are, because kids are getting more out of it. So, yeah, I just want to thank you again, uh, Assemblyman Wallace, for your leadership, your vision, and, uh, you know, just your smarts and, and push this thing over the, over the finish line. It could be truly a game changer uh, for, for kids and communities everywhere. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to see where this goes. And I want to thank you and uh, Jared at League Apps and everyone for all of the support that you've given with this idea and all of the, the work that you've done to make sure that this came to fruition. I think this is just the beginning of really, you know, doing more work in this space. So I'm excited to to look forward to doing that as well. And I'm sure we'll be in touch to talk about the criteria and um, how to make sure that that's shaped correctly so that the money goes where it's intended. So uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you again and um, enjoy the rest of the program. Okay, thank you again. Thanks. Thank you so much, Assembly Member Wallace and Tom for that enlightening conversation. I'd love to see New York become the model for states nationwide as a way to unlock game-changing funds for youth sports nonprofits. We've got a lot of great content to come, including a number of spotlights from impactful organizations in this space. And after a short break, an impact evaluation case study and conversation centered around the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation and their work with League Apps, Upmetrics, and Hello Insight. So stick around and enjoy the rest of the Fun Play Summit. First of all, DC Scores is one of the largest after-school youth development programs in the District of Columbia. We serve about 3,000 what we call poet athletes annually. And when I say poet athlete, I mean poet athlete. Think Amanda Gorman meets Bill Hamid, right? Uh, we're running full-fledged soccer leagues, um, full-fledged free soccer leagues, but every kid who participates in our program is also writing and performing original works of spoken word poetry with their teammates. I really think this is a, a first in class community partnership. Um, so, you know, in 2015, right around the time when DC United hadn't begun construction yet, but was in the process of building a new stadium um, in the District of Columbia, we basically, DC Scores became DC United's official community partner, the de facto CSR arm. Um, and I really think our partnership model is unique, not just in soccer, but really in the world of sports. Um, it touches every DC United stakeholder group, sponsors, suite holders, fans, staff, players, media, local government, schools. Um, and it's a positive impact on the club's culture and the brand and the bottom line. And for DC Scores, it has exponentially increased our ability to fundraise, brand raise, and most importantly, give really unique um, opportunities to our kids, to our poet athletes. At DC United, we don't have your standard foundation with a professional sports team. Um, we work with a variety of community partners within the district. Um, but DC Scores is certainly one that we do a lot with. We have a whole section devoted to kids um, attending our games on game day that are waving supporters flags right next to our main supporters group. Um, we have the annual gala here in the venue with some really cool experiences, typically like locker room tours in the normal world. Um, penalties on the pitch, things like that. And then throughout the year, we're involved in all of their programming through volunteer opportunities um, and other in-stadium and out-of-stadium um, engagement opportunities. So the, the DC United partnership is fundamentally, you know, increased our capacity to do the work at DC Scores that we do. And our work is about creating this generation of poet athletes that are physically and emotionally healthy um, and that have the skills to and are inclined to really 
speak up and act out against injustice. So, you know, we know that kids process what's going on around them in different ways. Some really look for opportunities to run around in the soccer field and be with their teammates, but others have something to say. They need a pen, they need a mic, they need a stage. Um, and we're able to give really the best of physical education and arts education to thousands of kids where they are at their schools at no charge. Um, and we've been able to serve more kids since partnering with DC United by attracting more sponsors, more donors. Um, we now have DC United players as guest coaches and guest referees and occasionally even as guest poets. Um, and our kids really feel like part of the club, right? So we're in seven out of eight wards. We're all over the city. Our kids literally have the DC United logo on their back. You can see we are co-branded as well. Um, so our kids feel part of the club in that way, but they also feel at home in the stadium. We have measured success by um, the deepened relationship with our direct community and the neighborhoods that we wouldn't necessarily have access to otherwise. And as time goes on um, within this partnership, we're continuing to develop the next generation of DC United fans even. So I think that's a really crucial piece of this partnership um, is creating a pipeline that will follow us for decades after, you know, for decades to come um, that will continue to come to Audi Field and cheer on the team, continue to be involved, continue to even support DC scores as they grow older and the next group of kids come into play. From the beginning, we've been really clear, both parties have been very clear on what the goals are um, for each of us and what we would like the outcomes to be. Um, and with having those clear and concise goals, we have made our communication very um, effective. Every time we're meeting, we know what's coming up already. We know what's on the schedule. We know what the program calendar looks like. So I think what's been key for us is that, um, communication and talking to each other weekly, if not daily, on how we can continue to work together and make sure that our piece of the programming um, is effective and organic um, as we further that with DC Scores. What makes this partnership work really is an alignment of business interest and impact. That's certainly what I love about it. You know, a lot of Pro sports teams are businesses and a lot of times, you know, the community work can be marketing driven, but the impact that DC United has had is, is so deep and extended because of how integrated our partnership is. Thanks so much um, for listening to us talk about our partnership. Uh, I'm, I personally am very interested in seeing more relationships like this grow in terms of community organizations and professional sports teams. Um, you know, I'm happy to have anyone reach out if you want to talk more about what our experience has been like, we're happy to do that. Um, but in the meantime, I really appreciate all of you giving the time and enjoying the fun play summit today. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all at Audi field sometime soon. Thanks.